All right. Uh, this is joint work with our uh, my co-authors listed there. And uh, in this particular work, we are exploring the use of reinforcement learning for learning optimization algorithms for integer programs. So I'll start out by setting the scene, explain what the big picture motivation behind this work is, um, by going into why we want to apply learning for discrete optimization problems. Uh, then I'll explain the specific problem setting that we are looking at, uh, something called a two-stage stochastic mixed integer program. Uh, I'll, I'll explain what that is, and, and this may potentially have connections to graphical model inference, so some of the ideas that we're exploring here could be transferred uh, for that application as well, although we haven't explored that in this particular work. Then I'll go into the details of our approach, uh, exactly how do we phrase this as a reinforcement learning problem, and you know, how do we learn the optimizer. And uh, I'll show some experiments, uh, and I'll conclude by showing some of the work or explaining some of the work that we're currently doing on top of what we have done in, in this work. Okay, so just to set the scene, uh, when I say we want to apply learning for discrete optimization, what I mean is there is some distribution of problem instances that you care about and you're allowed to sample from it, so you're allowed to generate problem instances from this distribution and now you can consider learning on those training instances uh, and, and come up with a new optimization heuristic that is specifically targeted for that distribution that you care about. So there will be some very slow and expensive training procedure that would operate on these instances, and the output of that will be an optimization algorithm, a, a new heuristic, which is tuned for the distribution. And then at test time, you would get new instances and apply this heuristic uh, to the new instances. And the optimization that happens at test time will be very fast. Uh, and hopefully, if the learning is successful, it should produce high quality solutions. So this is the setting that we are looking at. So we're not considering the case where we just have a single instance in isolation and asking whether we can apply learning to it. Now, there is a fairly natural uh, way to phrase this as an RL problem. Uh, in particular, we can think of the optimization algorithm as being defined in terms of a policy that we can learn. And this policy would propose solutions, and the environment will basically contain the objective function that says, okay, given a particular solution, how well did you do? So the reward would be a function of the objective value that that particular solution achieved. Right. And you could potentially get observations from your environment as well regarding you know, how close were you to violating various constraints in your optimization problem and so forth. So this line of work is not new. In fact, it's fairly old. Uh, there were several papers in the 90s that explored this particular direction. Uh, so Zhang and Dietrich is one of the earliest papers. Uh, Buan and Moore had a series of papers uh, in this area, um, an algorithm called Stage, uh, where, again, they applied RL or RL-like algorithms to discrete optimization problems. And now, more recently, uh, there is renewed interest in this area, and there are more papers coming out. Okay, so the specific problem, integer programming problem, that we're looking at is a two-stage stochastic integer program. The basic intuition is very simple. Uh, this kind of problem structure arises in various kinds of planning problems where uh, you need to make a set of planning decisions under uncertainty. So you have certain forecast distributions about what's going to happen in the future, and given these distributions, you need to decide, come up with a plan. So that's your stage one optimization problem. Then as time passes, you will observe these uncertain variables, the actual values that they took on. And after observing their values, there is a second stage where you're allowed to make adjustments to your original plan, what are called these recourse decisions. So the optimization of the recourse decisions is a deterministic problem because now you've already observed all your uncertain variables um, and, and there is no stochasticity involved there. So this kind of uh, problem pattern occurs in various applications. Uh, one particular example is electric grid day ahead planning where you know, your uncertainty is about uh, 
what the weather is going to be tomorrow, how much demand there will be, how much your wind farm is going to produce, and so forth. And you need to decide today you know, which power plants you want to turn on tomorrow and so forth. Um, and then you know, once you observe the weather tomorrow, there is an opportunity to adjust your plan that you made yesterday under uncertainty, and that becomes your recourse decision. So when you optimize for your planning decisions, your stage one decisions, you need to take into account the fact that there is a future opportunity to adjust your plan. So that results in this kind of a nested optimization problem. So what I'm showing here is just the mathematical formulation of what I explained in the previous slide. So for simplicity, let's consider the case where all the objective functions and constraints are linear. So x would be your first stage decision variables, your planning variables. And then uh, y would be your second stage variables, and omega would rep represent the uncertain variables in your problem. Right? So if the, the first stage optimization is a max over these x variables, uh, but at that point you don't know what omega is going to be, so, but you have access to a distribution from which you can generate samples. Um, and what you want to do is optimize for you know, your current cost and your expected cost. Uh, for your second stage optimization problem. So in the optimization literature, one of the standard ways in which this problem is dealt with is uh, what's called a sample average approximation. So the idea is to replace that expectation with a sample average. So you would generate samples for omega from P of omega, and then you would express that expectation as a sample average, and now you get uh, a deterministic optimization problem but one disadvantage of this approach is that now you need to replicate your y variable for every sample of omega that you have. So this results in a much bigger integer programming problem because now your number of variables will be the number of samples times the dimensionality of your y variables. And that can very quickly blow up even for a moderate number of samples, like a thousand samples. Right? Uh, so in practice, what people do is like you have experts who would sort of very carefully handpick the samples that you should be using to solve this optimization problem, and then they make sure that the problem size is small enough that you can actually use a branch and bound solver on that deterministic version of the problem. What we are trying to do is, okay, what if we don't have an expert handpicking these omega samples carefully, right? Can we actually learn a good policy that'll work well, even if such selection is not done? So for this work, let's just uh, keep things simple and assume that all the decision variables that we are trying to optimize are binary. Anyway, those are, that's the setting that makes the problem hard. You could, in, in general, you can have both binary and continuous variables, uh, but the hardness comes from the binary variables. So what we are going to do is uh, use RL to learn a local search optimizer. And this local search optimizer basically contains two parts. One that generates an initial solution by sampling from some distribution. And then the second part is a local move policy that says, okay, given the current solution, how do I make a local move from this point in order to get a better solution? So we're going to jointly learn both of these policies, the initialization policy and the local move policy, such that the resulting optimizer uh, produces very good results uh, quickly. So uh, this is just a, a diagram that explains what I've already mentioned. Uh, the initialization policy generates some x0, your uh, initial first stage decision variables. And the, the, the local move policy is, so consider the case where x0, x is all binary. Uh, a local move would be just a bit flip that you would apply to that binary vector. So the local moves policy would say, which bit do you want to flip at the current step? And that generates your next solution. Now, given that solution, you go to the environment and ask how well does this solution perform? Now, once you're given x, if you can sample omega, this evaluating x simply boils down to solving a set of deterministic optimization problems. Right? So uh, this can be done very fast using a standard off-the-shelf branch and bound solver, and that's exactly what we do. Um, and that would provide us stochastic estimates of the objective uh, function value, as well as how close were we to violating various constraints and so forth. So those 
quantities would then be produced as observations from the environment, which would then feed back into the local move policy, and uh, you will get the next bit flip that, that you want to perform. So this iterative procedure is applied for a certain number of steps, and the solution that you would get at the end of that uh, is the final solution that you would output. OK, so just exp uh, going into the details of the two different policies that we are jointly learning. The initialization policy is essentially a distribution over the X space. So we learn a, a conditional autoregressive distribution over X. Now, this uh, distribution is conditional on the particular instance that you are currently solving. So we assume that there is a, a vector available, some description vector of that instance available, Z, on which the distribution can condition uh, before it generates the initial solution. So the autoregressive distribution uh, is trained using uh, reinforce, uh, a basic reinforcement learning algorithm, uh, where, so here in this setting, the action would be to generate, to, to, to produce a sample from this distribution, and the reward would be the final objective value that you achieved uh, at the end of all the local moves by starting from that particular solution. And the learning algorithm would then encourage the distribution to generate initial solutions that would eventually lead to good final solutions. The local move policy um, is basically a standard uh, softmax distribution that specifies which dimension of your x vector you want to flip next given your current solution, uh, your current state, as well as the particular context or the, the, the particular instance that, that you are currently solving. Um, and this particular policy is trained using uh, this algorithm asynchronous advantage, or act, advantage actor critic. Um, please come to the poster to go into the details of these algorithms, but uh, this is basically uh, the, sort of a, a standard, well-established reinforcement learning algorithm for learning these kinds of policies. And the reward we would use for training this policy is the change in objective value that we achieved by making a particular bit flip. Okay, now, the, one of the nice properties of you know, off-the-shelf branch and bound solvers is that they don't just provide you a solution, they also tell you how close to optimum that solution is. Uh, so it provides a bound. Now, in the case of a learned optimizer, so you know, most papers that apply learning for optimization problems only produce a solution and do not provide a bound uh, that says how well, that, how good that solution is. So here, we actually provide a bound as well. And the way we do it is by learning what we call a dual policy. So here, the idea is uh, to use dual decomposition. So we would start with our original objective function. And then we would say, uh, instead of treating x as a single vector, consider allowing uh, a different x vector for every sample of omega that you have in your data set. Obviously, that's not the problem you want to solve. But that allows you to decompose your stochastic problem into a set of deterministic problems. And now you add an extra term that says, okay, even though I allowed x to be different for every sample of omega, I do want them to be similar to each other. Uh, so there's an extra term that pr promotes consistency across these solutions. And that involves this dual variable lambda. So uh, can I answer at the end or, all right. Um, so th th this uh, dual variable is computed by a neural network, uh, which would take the sample as well as the context as inputs and then uh, produce a dual variable as the output. Now one, good, one uh, advantage of this approach is that this can actually generalize to new uh, instances of the optimization problem as well. Uh, unlike in standard optimization where you have to infer these dual variables from scratch given a new problem. Okay, so experiments. Uh, we basically focused on applying this algorithm to a, the two-stage version of knapsack and facility location problems um, for various problem sizes. Uh, 
So at the poster, I can go into the details of these problems, but they're essentially, even though the single stage deterministic version of these problems may be tractable, uh, once you make it stochastic and two stage, they actually become very expensive to solve. And uh, we, we'll see that you know, by applying our algorithm to these problems, we're able to do better than uh, off the shelf solutions. And in terms of data, we generate multimodal distributions for both the instances as well as the samples, the omega variables for each instance. And the baselines that we compare to are, uh, so one is the sample average approximation uh, approach that I mentioned before, and other uh, baselines are taboo search and progressive hedging. Now, one thing to notice is that um, these algorithms don't have the ability to learn these baseline algorithms. They treat every instance independently. Uh, there is a way to provide some form of minimal learning uh, with these, some of these algorithms by doing some kind of a nearest neighbor lookup. So at training time, you can solve as many instances as you want, keep around their solutions, and then at test time, you can do a nearest neighbor lookup of, of the instances seen at training time and sort of warm start from their solutions. So we provide this nearest neighbor uh, initialization for both table search and progressive hedging. Okay, so... Uh, when we compare our algorithm to sample average approximation with branch and bound, uh, basically the main result we see is that uh, we can achieve a lot better objective function value if uh, both algorithms are given the same amount of running time. And if you allow uh, sample average approximation and, and branch and bound to run long enough, it will eventually catch up in terms of objective function value with our approach. But at the minimum, it requires an order of magnitude more running time. So we, our approach is able to generate you know, much better solutions a lot faster. And if you compare across all the algorithms, so with taboo search and progressive hedging, uh, they're more easily comparable to our approach because the number of steps can be kept the same. The number of optimization steps can be kept the same across these algorithms. And that's what we do in our comparisons. And what we end up seeing is that uh, the, the, our approach is able to outperform the, uh, all these other algorithms on almost all the problems. One interesting pattern to see here is that, so we tried learning only the initializa initialization policy and only the local move policy and you know, both together. And there's a clear pattern that you know, it, it's important to learn both of them jointly in order to get the best performance. And the other thing to notice is that our dual policy is able to get you know, within a bound that's within 20% of the actual op uh, optimum solution that we found. Um, so again, you know, that provides us some uh, indication of how good our solution is. Uh, lastly, if you look at what the optimizer is actually doing on individual instances, generally what you see is that you know, there is this monotonic improvement in the objective function value as the algorithm runs, the local search algorithm runs. So you know, there is no constraint in the algorithm that the objective function value has to monotonically increase. Right? That is purely learned. Um, and you do see that for a significant fraction of the instances, the improvement need not be monotonic. So you can see, for example, uh, a sudden decrease in your objective function value, and then it goes back up again such that the final solution uh, ends up better. Right? So, it is, it, it can potentially show non-greedy behavior. Uh, so the next steps, uh, we've been focusing on graph structured problems. So in this particular work, uh, we, we've been dealing with instances that have like a, a very simple flat representation, but in many real applications, the instances are graphs. So it's interesting to see whether this kind of approach can work well in that setting. Um, and we use graph neural networks combined with this kind of local search learning to deal with such problems. Another important direction uh, that we are trying to explore is to understand the limits of generalization for this problem. Um, so, you know, we expect that as the distribution of instances becomes uh, very broad and you know uniform, the advantage of learning will likely disappear. Right. So it's the fact that these distributions are sort of, you know, much more restricted is what allows learning to succeed. Uh, 
and what exactly is the boundary at which you know, learning stops providing any advantage. So that's something we are looking into. And we've been focusing heavily on applying this on some real applications. And we have some preliminary results that show uh, promising performance. Uh, it's still not published, but it should be published soon. Thank you. <laughs>